Hello, hello. Testing, can you hear me? All right, hi everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, if you're out there and you wanna move into the event space. Um, welcome to GSC Labs and welcome to our second Pioneer Pitch Night. Um, my name is Kate Newton. I am the uh, center director of this space that you're sitting in. Um, and we are really excited tonight. We have 10 enterprise SaaS companies um, ready to pitch for you. Um, so I'm not gonna take up too much time, um, but if this is your first time here, or if you don't know what GSV Labs does, um, I wanna give you a little bit of context to start off with. So GSV stands for Global Silicon Valley. Um, and basically the way we think about that is Silicon Valley not only as a place, but as a mindset. Um, so it's a mindset that's given rise to some of the largest technology companies. That and so we do that in a couple different ways. Uh, one way we work with startups is through physical communities. So we have this one and one in Boston, where we support about 175 startup companies. Um, over since 2015, we've supported about 800, uh, and those companies have raised over $600 million. Um, we supply those companies here with flexible office space, community events, and programming. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have a digital community. We launched GSV Passport last year, uh, which is basically an online one-stop shop for founders uh, where they can get you know, all kinds of resources. Um, some of those include over 200 mentors uh, that you can scroll, th scroll through and book meetings right on their calendar. Um, it includes over 450 investors that tap into our community for deal flow. Um, and it includes over $700,000 in free and discounted services. So if you're out there and you use AWS or Segment or HubSpot um, or Airtable, we pre-negotiate really good discounts, basically. So if you haven't checked out Passport, check it out. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to Brex. Um, they have a table in the back. If you haven't heard of Brex, they are the first corporate credit card designed for startups in mind. Um, and GSV Labs is actually a Brex user. Um, they're really great. So if you haven't heard of Brex, make sure to talk to Bia back there um, and learn all about it. And if you are a GSV Passport member, um, you get waived fees for life, which is kind of cool. So we're going to get started in a minute. Um, I want to give a shout out to the three judges we have here tonight. They're right in the front row. Um, we have our own uh, Director of Enterprise Innovation here, Tara. Uh, we have Dan Avita of Opus Capital. And we also have Dominique Wong, who is the Head of Growth at ZenReach. Our judges will be watching the pitches throughout the night, taking notes, um, and have a little bit of time to deliberate at the end to find a winner. The winner tonight will get $2,000 um, and two free hot dust at our center for a whole year. Um, so if you wanted to be up here pitching tonight, stay tuned. We hold these every month. Um, and the application's gonna come up for January pretty soon, so look out. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna bring up our first company. Please welcome Charles of Lumino. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, my name's Charles. I'm the co-founder of Lumino. We build plug and play operations for startups. The role of a startup COO or any business operations leader is to build systems that scale and allow the company to grow. And unfortunately, this is still really hard. Any operator will be familiar with tasks like these, finding the exact right SaaS tool, connecting SaaS tools with Zapier, papering over the gaps between SaaS tools using your, your employees. Luminal provides a faster, cheaper way to build workflows. Let me share an example. We work with a small direct consumer e-commerce company that does most of their selling through Instagram influencers. Their old process before Luminal was extremely manual. It involved lots of sending emails back and forth, exchanging assets, docu-signs, and in total, it took the team that was doing it about 100 person hours per month. Now, a few months ago, they realized that they weren't gonna hit their revenue targets unless they could onboard another 5,000 influencers in short order. Their process wasn't gonna scale. So we started working with them. We built some custom internal tools to automate and manage their process, and also spun up a small team of outsourced virtual assistants to take care of the tasks that couldn't be automated. Using Luminal, we cut back their workload to six hours per month. Effectively, we were able to abstract away all the operational complexity and allow them to focus on the things that they were best at, like deciding which content to deliver to their influencers. Now, this is just one example. We have interviewed dozens of startups and we've found candidate workflows in almost every vertical, from sales to marketing, 
even venture capital. We're able to do this scalably because many business processes uh, are more similar than they are different. What that means is that the internal tools used to support those processes have a lot of common components. Things like sending drip emails and selecting the right item from a list. These are things that have applications nearly universally in things from as diverse as recruiting to affiliate marketing. Luminal's software framework allows us to quickly stitch together these core components in order to build internal tools. Our business model is basically an arbitrage between how quickly and cheaply companies can build systems for themselves and how quickly we can do it. In our research, we also discovered that, co that companies really don't love paying for huge stacks of SaaS tools in order to do what they're trying to do. And so our pricing model is also unique. We charge for use, just like an API. If you want to onboard one employee this month, we'll charge you once. If you want to onboard 10, we'll charge you 10 times. It's that simple. You only pay for what you use. We're very early on, but we have some exciting uh, market validation. We're currently working with three customers who we believe will grow to represent about 20K of MRR. And we also have nine customers uh, waiting in the wings. The thing that really gets us excited, though, is the enthusiasm we hear when we talk to operators about how they can outsource their processes to us and get them built quickly. We believe that the explosion in growth of the business process uh, mapping and RPA markets are a clear indication that companies are hungry for ways to drive down their operating costs. We're going into a very big market, and we believe we're the right team to do this. Uh, this is my third company. Sam, my co-founder, has built a thousand-person business process outsourcing team uh, in India. And we're, we've both been building startup operations for about collectively 20 years. So we're not currently raising, but we are trying to learn as much about uh, different workflows as possible, document workflows, and talk to people who have operational challenges. So uh, if you have any ops that you feel like are holding you back, please come and find us afterwards. Thank you. All right, thank you, Charles. Um, I'd like to welcome our next startup up. Um, it's called Artemis, and they are disrupting the augmented reality learning experience. Please welcome J.R. Skook. Hello. Oh, there we go. Uh, hello, I am J.R. Skook, and I am here with Artemis EDU. We are working to create an augmented reality learning experience. Now, the challenge is that the world is changing. New te technologies are evolving, changing what the nature of work is, and a lot of times education is just not keeping up. And that's why Artemis is going to be building this educational ecosystem that wants to deliver on the digital physical uh, interface that's going to really define this future of work and play. Um, the educational market is absolutely huge. It's in the trillions of dollars worldwide, um, including lots of different aspects. But specifically, this kind of digital spend in education is just um, growing at an incredible pace. It's expected to go from what is now around 150 billion to 340 billion in the next five years. And a smaller part, but still um, growing fast, is augmented reality in particular, going from around 2 billion um, last year to over 12 billion by estimates in just a few years from now. And so with those markets growing, there's a lot of room for us to uh, grab a piece and build something that creates value and can deliver results to our students and teachers and parents. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating this AR educational ecosystem, something that can go after formal in classroom as well as informal learning through stu uh, tutoring and at home learning as well. We want to help prepare students and uh, children to face this augmented reality economy of the future. Um, and by doing, by bringing and making learning physical again, you know, after all day on your computer, on the screens, everywhere, we want to have great physical products that students can learn with and take the advantage of all the digital information that we have, bring it back to something physical. And while we're eventually going to go after K through 12, we're going to start with a market of around um, K to 5. And we are currently working to raise our Series A. 
Now, this company is based um, on heritage from another company called Astro Reality that made some of the best planetary models um, you can find on the market. Earth and Moon and Mars, and uh, we have the Earth at our demo table if you want to come stop by later. And um, augmented reality was added to that as kind of an additional benefit, a way to take data sets, add them to a physical planet. And this product found so much demand from teachers around the world. Um, they all wanted to have this technology, have something physical in their classroom that then had all the digital richness that this data sets can provide. But Astro Reality wasn't able to meet that demand. And so that's what Artemis is trying to do. We have the demand, we have the schools, the teachers ready for this technology, and we just need to build something that meets their specific needs. And so the t um, access is there, the um, access to demand is there, we know who they are, and we have the experienced team ready to build these tools and deliver. So I am the CSO, Chief Science Officer, um, years of experience with creating the data sets, creating educational plans, lesson plans at the um, college level and the science camps at STEM levels from uh, K through 12. We have a great business through our uh, CEO, Joanne Dai, and um, uh, Jian Zhu, who can, our CTO, able to build the platform technology. So our team's ready to go, has the experts we need um, ready to build these experiences. Now, what makes us different is that we're going to create outstanding products that are already starting to go in schools. So we have uh, user reviews already, teachers telling us what they love, what they don't love, giving us valuable information to jump on that market. Um, we have great uh, content partners, people who know the information, know the lesson plans, can make this um, as soon as the funding's in place and the tools, um, the software is ready to go. And we're using cutting edge technology, as, uh, SLAM observations, computer vision, to make this experience interactive and exciting. Um, the way this works for students is that they have a physical object, something they can play with. Even when the power's out, they have something fun to play with. And then, if they do have power, a tablet, a uh, smartphone, or maybe someday wearables, they'll add a whole other level of richness to it. They can access um, new information about what they're looking at, say an Earth model. They can look at data sets. They can look at uh, trips around the planet. They can have quizzes that keeps them engaged, understands how they're working, uh, evaluates them as they go. and um, connects to teachers who can create content. Now, we're going to be selling to both parents and schools, um, uh, licenses to schools, parents will have products, as well as more um, facilities. And so we are hoping to um, you know, get a first product, alpha test after six months after funding, uh, public release within a year, and then spend our time expanding our reach to schools, give them the tools they need, and making what they want. Now, um, there's lots of other companies working in the edtech market. You know, it's a big market, so there's a lot going on. But what really sets us apart is uh, content creation, that platform we talked about, that teacher's dashboard where um, st uh, teachers and educators can create the content that they want to put into our platform. And so, you know, we have the team ready, we have a MVP ready to go, and all the partners ready. And so once we get the funding, we're ready to hit the ground running and create something of value. Thank you. Thank you, Artemis. You hit the five-minute mark perfectly. All right, I'd like to welcome our next company, Ambi, to the stage. Uh, this is Sharik Shah, and Ambi is building a new kind of free music platform for businesses. There we go. Um, hello, everybody. From bars to barbershops, our vision is to bring affordable, licensed music into every single business in the country and combine that music with the power of technology to elevate the retail experience. Hello, everybody. My name is Sharik Shah. I'm the founder and CEO of Ambi. I'm here to talk to you about a $1.2 billion problem. Today, 82% of businesses illegally stream unlicensed music through personal Spotify and Pandora accounts. These businesses risk massive fines, lack any personalization options, and make it so that our artists don't get paid for their work. Every year, hundreds of businesses face major litigation due to music licensing issues. So after we talk to them, we realize that most of them don't even know they're doing anything wrong. But even after we tell them, it all boils down to the fact that they don't want to spend money on music. So instead of fighting and arguing and making, trying to make them pay for something they don't want to pay for, Ambi positions itself to be the only option for these business owners to legally play licensed music in their stores for free. A store owner can simply register their location, set the mood, tempo, era, genre, and the overall ambiance they want in their store, and they can immediately start playing music through our mobile application. 
We leverage the fact that these businesses are open for over 200 hours per month. Just by playing some audio ads during the store's active hours, we can make more than enough money to fairly pay the artists, pay the labels, and ourselves. On top of that, having a free option makes it easier for us to be the ones to convert these businesses onto a subscription over time. So we want to penetrate the market with our free model, but quickly follow that up with AI-driven solutions that help these businesses drive sales. We already have a prototype that is able to pick up on sales trends in these stores and match them to the genre, era, popularity, and other music metadata portions uh, to those sales trends. Essentially, what we can do is we can understand what type of music drives sales most effectively at an individual store level. Today, we have around 100 locations pre-registered to use our technology in their stores, including two chains. We participated in the G-Beta Music Accelerator program, which allowed us to work with Capitol Records and Universal Music Group. We have completed our product and are working on product iterations with our pre-registered users. We have a massive ad network that is backing us, providing us with high, demand, uh, high quality on-demand audio ads from around the country. And on top of that, we have all of the music licensing, metadata, and catalog deals that we need to succeed. We've done all of this without raising a single penny. Um, I want to talk about this first. So uh, just last week, we received a $400,000 commitment from a major venture capital firm, and we are seeking one more investor to round out our round. Once again, my name is Sharik Shah. I'm the technical founder with a background in music tech. I wrote software for Gracenote, which is one of the leaders in music tech. I did technical leadership for a project at NASA, and I helped found the Startup Accelerator program at San Jose State University, and I act as a mentor to about a dozen student-led startups. <laughs> I met my co-founder, Jake, very early on in our college years. As arrogant and overconfident computer science students, we decided to build a video game together. It wasn't a good video game. But ever since then, we've been working on product and product until we both found something that we're passionate about, Ambi. I met my other co-founder, Alora, while I was speaking at a leadership program that she runs. Turns out she has eight years, of leader, uh, eight years of experience running a sales and marketing firm. She very quickly became our third. Every year, $1.2 billion is stolen from artists who can barely just make it by themselves, doing Uber and Lyft and other side hustles to help power their passion. We will be the ones to help them get it back. Thank you. Sorry, don't look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sheree. All right, I'm going to welcome Aniri Pradhan to the stage next. She's the CEO of Envision Mobile. Uh, and showing that uh, enterprise SaaS is not just for Fortune 500s anymore. Uh, she is um, giving new products to emerging markets. Hi, everyone. My name is Aniri Pradhan, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Envision Mobile. We are digitizing corner stores and emerging markets. There is over $4 trillion reported by Bloomberg in consumer spend annually in emerging markets. That's conservative. A lot of estimates are actually closer to $10 trillion. However, 80% of that spend goes through 400 million corner stores. They buy on credit for com from consumer product goods companies and sell on credit to their customers. They already have sophisticated supply chains in place with Unilever, Procter Gamble, and Coca-Cola. Do you know how they currently collect information on their products? They send people and spend thousands of dollars to these shops to count inventory levels on shelves and look at paper pen ledgers. So emerging markets are lifting Procter & Gamble and Unilever, uh, and they're reporting most of their sales in these markets. Um, and I know this firsthand because I have a, um, spent over a decade in emerging markets, South Asia and East Africa, working with distributors, and I understand how archaic these systems are. I founded a uh, distribution financing firm in Uganda that got acquired this year, and I used to work on Facebook's emerging markets innovations team, prototyping new technologies for these, for these types of users. 
Um, my co-founder, Eric, has a PhD in information systems technology from Penn State. He participated in the Peace Corps in Cameroon and also was a Fulbright Scholar in Rwanda. Vivian's our first employee. She's our sales lead in Nairobi, who has a background in um, B2B sales. So using our knowledge and expertise, we designed an application for the corner store. Uh, very simple to use. They are not able to afford uh, hardware point of sale systems or uh, cash registers, but they have smartphones. And we're leveraging their smartphones now to use to manage their own businesses and directly order products on consignment from retailers in, or from distributors, incentivizing them to use the application. But our killer app feature is credit tracking. Most corner stores actually sell on credit to their customers, and they don't have a way to recoup these money without just remembering who owes them money or writing it down on a piece of paper. Our app lets them actually record and see who owes them money and make calls to them within the app and set reminders. But our business model is the data, and we sell this data to distributors and consumer product goods companies who are already a billion dollars that is spent through market activation campaigns through retailers. And uh, we estimate this by capturing 5% of the market as a $1 billion opportunity. We have a B2B to C model where we uh, sit on top of the existing supply chain between the consumer product goods companies and the corner stores, uh, offering as a third party data aggregator this information to empower everyone in the supply chain from the small corner store to the large CPG. Uh, currently, we, we raised an a accelerator friends and family round, and we launched our product in March. Uh, we hired a Vivian in the summer, and then we la 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 launched a pilot in Kenya with Unilever, and did customer discovery and understandings to iterate our product, and now have signed up four distributors to our platform. Um, our go-to-market uh, is that we believe that by um, in the next three years, we'll be able to achieve um, significant growth and traction. And our vision is to be the Nielsen for emerging markets, collecting vast amounts of data on consumer spend. Uh, this is just a testimonial from one of our corner store users that she really liked, loves the app. It's great for her to track her stock and sales, and it helps her do something that she couldn't do before, which is manage her business well. So if you want to be a part of the hottest next emerging market startup, please come speak to me after. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome Jarlath O'Caro to the stage. He is the CEO of Job Speaker, who is bridging the gap between education and employment. Good evening. Um, my name is Jarlath O'Carroll, and I'm the CEO and founder of JobSpeaker. Uh, JobSpeaker is uh, something I started when I got laid off uh, back in the, during the financial crisis in 2009. Um, and I started it uh, to, as this slide says, to bridge the skills gap between education and employment. So uh, who here, hands up, uh, has had a good experience with career advising and can rely on somebody as a mentor and as, as an advisor today to help them kind of transi transition their career from where they are today to where they want to go. Who has had that good experience? Okay, only a few. That's the problem we're solving, right? Uh, because what we feel is nobody has that advisor uh, that can help them get from where they, were to where they are today to where they want to go in the medium term and then ultimately in the longer term. We want to prevent this. And we want to prevent this for everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, background, socio socioeconomic status. Because the future looks like this. Actually, this is here today. Particularly in the Silicon Valley, this is here today. Because everybody here changes jobs, what, every 18 months? Right? Um, so this is here today. Um, and so what you need to do is to upskill as you're going from job to job. Earn new skills at that new job and then continue to earn more skills and understand when you need to earn skills in order to transition to that next job that you want to go. So that's what we do. We help institutions work with employers. We help institutions understand how their curriculum is matching the needs of employers and how employers can help find the right students with the right skills. This is the, the situation today. 
where there's a bunch of transactional systems that don't cooperate, there's no common language, there's no common services, and there's no connected infrastructure bringing them all together. That's what we do. We provide the common language that connects uh, the, the student to the workforce uh, from the institution's perspective. We bring a set of services together that allows that, that college and the employer and the student to work together in an engagement kind of seamless interaction. And we provide a supporting infrastructure to bring it all together from a regional, state, and even US perspective. Um, I'll skip through these really quickly. Happy to talk about it later over on our, on our table. Uh, common language means we assess the skills that are being earned in the classroom. Common services, we provide all the services that a college needs to engage with both sides of that equation, the students on one side and the employers on the other. And we bring that together in, a, like I said, a region, a state, and uh, uh, nationally. Uh, we're fully deployed on Android and an iPhone today. Um, you, can, you can download it. This is what a skills profile looks like uh, for a student. We express those skills so students don't have to understand how to express it themselves, so that employers can understand it. And that converts directly into a resume. Uh, the institutions have uh, management of the whole platform, how to engage both sides, again, both sides of the, of the equation. Uh, and employers have uh, their configurable dashboard and interface as well. Uh, we're focused on the skill builders, the CTE, the career and technical education side of education for now. But ultimately, we see uh, we're aiming at that 139 billion in, uh, in where the education meets recruitment. Um, there's lots of competitors out there, but there's none that brings it together the way we bring it together in one cohesive, uh, seamless system for student, uh, educator, and employer, and particularly for the student as they look to manage their career. Uh, current customers, 50 plus uh, community colleges in California. Here's one of the testimonials from one of our customers. Um, our skill taxonomy is growing every day. Um, projected revenue, uh, we doubled la this year from last year. We expect to double or triple next year. And uh, in the pie there, it's explaining that ultimately our revenue will mostly come from employers. Today, it comes from colleges. A uh, team, myself, 25 plus years in, in technology. Uh, our advisor, Brian, uh, was the first employee at um, the GNU Foundation at MIT. And I've worked with uh, several of these people for over 20 years. And, and we're looking to raise five million uh, based on where we are today, that, that we're ready to scale. We have a product, we're ready to go. Thank you. Up next, I'd like to welcome Blue Dot and Sophia Zhang, CEO. Um, she, they are working to modernize cities' economic development. Over the next decade, there will be a tectonic change in the type of technologies that are used across all local governments across the country. Now, I'm not talking about the state or the federal government's uh, technologies. I'm talking about in the local cities and counties that we all live in, the technologies that are used to operate and run every single thing that we depend on in our daily lives. I don't think I have to convince any of you that the government systems are antiquated. It is extremely antiquated, extremely inefficient, and the pain is still very, very real. Now, the pain is also on a massive scale. There are over 90,000 local government units in the US alone, and they together spend over $50 billion a year in IT technology. At Blue Dot, we're proud to tackle the issue on top of Mayor's priority list, economic development. Now, put yourself in the shoes of an economic development manager at a local city. You have to support and manage and grow 5,000 local businesses in your city. And yet, for you to even know what are the 5,000 businesses in your city, you have to go to a different department and ask them for Excel spreadsheet export. If a city, if a business closed in your city, you find out in the local news. You walk into a business and you want to say, what do you need? You have no idea what licenses they hold, 
what permits they hold, which ones they have applied to, how long they have even been in your city. You have none of those information, and even though all of the information sits somewhere in your city. This has to change because it's ridiculous. That is where we come in. Blue Dot is the first smart business software platform that is built exactly to address this need. We provide a centralized dashboard to provide a centralized view of each business's journey in your city. With integration and automation, we allow them to automate their processes, and also we provide data-driven insights that can allow them to make the most important strategic decisions. Now, when I talk about GovTech, all of you are probably all of you are probably thinking, oh, long project cycle, slow adoption. Those are probably true in the past. However, with the newer cloud and SaaS-based things, which are totally old news for the rest of us, the government is slow due to adopting those, and we're already seeing evidence that they are revolutionizing the way GovTech is run, the same way they transformed enterprise software. Within eight months, we started with one city at the city of Wuna Creek. We designed, built, and deployed a software platform and securing the paid contract. In the two months after that, we have already expanded to four more cities, and we're seeing dramatic um, traction in California as well as across the US. But that is only the beginning of our vision. Imagine this. When we onboard one city, we didn't just onboard one city. We onboarded thousands, if not tens of thousands of business owners at a time. As a second step, we will make Blue Dot external facing, becoming the direct communication channel between the business owner and the cities. We will be the connective tissue in every city's economic development. And ultimately, our goal is to digitize and datatize all local economies around the world. That means bringing all data, all business owners to collaborate with each other, creating a network effect, but also getting the deep data that we know we need for the local economies. We have a very strong team. My name is Sophia. Um, we have degrees from Stanford, Wharton, and Engineering, and Penn Engineering. We are also part of the City Innovate organization. Um, and we have a development team of five that is very experienced in enterprise software. Lastly, I'm just going to leave you with this. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because this must exist. This must exist because it makes no sense for these dedicated city staff to not have the right tools to do their job. This must exist because we believe in the power of local economies and local communities. This must exist because this is what cities and counties should look like in the 21st century. My name is Sophia, and we're Blue Dot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I'd like to welcome our next company, Inventurist, um, and speaker, Sierra Shakiri. Um, I'm a fan favorite here because they are a longtime GSC Labs member, um, and they take the guesswork out of developing and introducing new products to the market. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, hi, my name is Sierra Shakiri, uh, CEO co-founder of Inventurist. And I'm here with my co-founder, Gil, who's sitting in the back, and Andre is in Europe. Um, we have built an enterprise uh, AI SaaS product that is for big companies and making sense of strategic decisions in companies. But let's hear it from our customers who have used our platform to make decisions about uh, customer segments to focus on, uh, to work on refining their product strategy, uh, or work on refining their business model for innovation projects that they have. And in all of these cases, the common factor is strategic decisions that um, worth millions of dollars for companies. But what is actually Inventurist AI? Uh, again, in the language of one of our customers from one of the, the top tire manufacturers, what Inventurist AI does is receives value propositions of a product that is going to be built and list of customer segments and through uh, algorithmic, algorithmic approaches and looking into data sources ranks the matches between customer segments and value propositions. So at the end, the output that you get is a heat map of the product market landscape. And this is where our users uh, look at the uh, 
uh, strategic decisions that they have to make about which market to enter, what kind of product to build, and maybe uh, what companies to buy to address the needs of those markets. The result of uh, analysis that our AI does, for example, in one example of a strategic decisions in launching new products is reducing the time that takes for these companies uh, in the order of uh, months and cost, that is order of millions of dollars for some of these big companies, and then increase the rate, rate of success. So that's the value that these companies get from using our AI platform. But there are many of these million dollar questions in big companies. And the value of uh, analyzing the approach to market and product and finding these intersections basically is across the enterprise in different functions. Sales and marketing, uh, new product development as I mentioned, business development, and corporate strategy. And this is our path to scale. So if we get this right in one area that we are focusing on, which is new product, then the path to scale for us is to apply to the rest of the uh, organization. We are a strong team of um, AI experts. I have a PhD in AI 20 years ago when AI was not a good word. I have applied AI in the past 20 years in enterprise uh, context. I have worked for SAP, uh, the big uh, enterprise software company, as well as my co-founder, Andre. We have both PhDs in AI. Uh, Zolo is our third PhD in AI, but we also have applied AI to uh, enterprise problems. And we have seen winters of AI, if you have heard of it, and so now that summer of AI, we know what to look for and what uh, limitations and strengths AI has for solving big problems in enterprise. Our business model is SaaS. This is the delivery of the product. But at the same time, we have a roadmap to start from the top of the enterprise. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the plan is to uh, get into subscription model, uh, which is basically midterm. And then in the longer term, which is path again to scale, get to the rest of the enterprise and uh, democratize uh, the uh, business advice and business decision making for every decision maker in the enterprise, which is at the bottom of the uh, hierarchy. Uh, we have a strong sales pipeline, a uh, dozen projects uh, that are in pilot mode, and three repeat customers in semiconductor, telecom, manufacturing, and especially automotive that we are focusing on. The competitive advantage of uh, what we are doing is that we are rising above uh, what is going on in this landscape of analyzing product versus market. So this is a, a little bit uh, crowded slide. And we actually track uh, competition with our own AI. So yes, we eat our own dog food. And uh, gradually, we are pushing the envelope from the left side of the picture to the right side of the picture, which is still analyzed by big consulting companies. And that's where the, uh, uh, basically the, the pioneering of uh, this technology is going to be. And that takes us to um, the uh, basically territory that big consulting companies like McKinsey's of the world are, and this is a huge market. Uh, imagine uh, the time that we could have equivalent of a McKinsey at every desk of a decision maker. And that's uh, our vision. We are raising $3 million seed to uh, expand the development team and build the product, marketing, and the rest of the operations. Um, this would take us from six people to 18 people in 18 months, and from uh, three customers to 15 customers, and then uh, eventually toward Series A fundraising, and with a little bit of cash still in the bank to have a cushion um, left. Thank you very much, and please stop by our live demo table and uh, give us your feedback and comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yumi Kamura. She's the CEO of a company called LEAD, and they are uh, helping organizations develop amazing workplace culture. So uh, we are in a global war for employees and also 
uh, the company culture is not an option anymore. There's a lot of evidence showing that friendship can bring a sense of a community and can lead to each individual have a sense of belonging. So as you can see here, if you have more than 25 friends in a company, there's 71% of people saying they love the company compared to people who does not have friends. There's only 21%. So companies know this is very important. That's why they spend a lot of money on you know, cater lunches, team building, holiday parties, and each of them costs a lot of money. For example, a company with 5,000 employees, they spend $24 million a year just to create environments that people can meet new friends. However, minorities, women, and also introverts, they don't really like those environments and they're not really meeting friends. So companies spend a lot of money but do not serve the purpose, so they start to learn, okay, maybe we should tenderize those match one-on-one -on -one to support those introverts and women and minorities. So companies start to build, you know, shuffle lunches, uh, coffee dates, buddy programs, all the things, right? And then, then it's working. However, there's problems. We have, we have a company that we're talking to. They have 500 people in their product team, and the HRs are matching them through Excel sheet. And then it's working. Well, they know that people are happier, there's more productivity. However, there's no data for them to track or to get better insights. So this, that's why we build a lead. It's easy for HR to match people for different purpose, and then, then we focus on employees' mental safety and also privacy. So in this case, HR can automize those matches while we collect the data from people's behaviors and then post service, and then collect the data in a way that employees are able to meet people easily. So we are a cross-platform solution. It works with Workday. Uh, sorry, it works with um, um, Slack, email, and also Microsoft Teams. So employees can find the time that's convenient for them to meet their coworkers on their own terms. And this actually is not just about matching people. It's about to really help companies to understand how they can create a more connected workforce through friendship and also mentorship, even sponsorship. You can use this to connect remote the workforce to target um, organization intervention for better employee engagement, retention, and performance. And then because we are building this data to connect the companies, so we are really able to analyze the employees' collaborative network and understand where the information come and go. It's not just about who you are and who you know right now. Think about this. Like if you are in a company and then you want to build your career, that's what's in it for you, then our software are able to connect you with someone you should know. As a company, what does that mean is that your departments will be able to have different people to know people who they should know. What does that mean is that better revenue for you, higher retention, and there's so many things we can do with the data. So um, my background is that I have human resource background from both work and school. Um, I have a people analytics background, and also I built Made to Japan um, as their head of Japan through the 5 billion IPO. Uh, the purpose, sorry, the um, practice we did in Made to Japan were built into the software. My co-founders, Ayman and Jay, are great engineers. Ayman has extensive um, knowledge in not just AI, but also behavior scientists. So we, um, right now, have about 40 companies using our technology, and then, then we are launching our uh, seed funding, raising from this week. If you are interested in either the solution or the you know investment opportunities, you can come to talk to me later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yumi. Up next, we have Sanjeev Nair, COO of NLP Bots. And they are uh, building a platform that powers AI products across a variety of enterprise functions. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Sanjeev, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, at NLP Bots. Uh, what NLP Bots does is enterprise uh, automate enterprise conversations and processes. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, basically, if you look at any enterprise today, we are, uh, everyone builds a lot of uh, systems to manage conversations across users. Uh, across various functions, right? Be it customers, be it employees, be it vendors, resellers, and partners. Uh, all of these are pretty much your call centers backed by a, a, a large number of human resource teams who are driving data, driving processes and stuff. Uh, most of these are, not, are kind of costly. Uh, they're not efficient and scalable enough. Uh, and they are obviously because of the way of how you deal with users across various uh, mediums. Uh, it is not easy to deliver a consistent user experience across it. And most importantly, uh, the amount of data that is being generated across companies today, uh, be it uh, on social media, be it on, on across your engagement channels, is not easily processable to drive more efficient conversations. So uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, if you look at the data growth uh, uh, in the recent times, uh, unstructured data has been growing at like 80%. And it is supposed to cross about you know 45,000 exabytes in the next year. Uh, so how do you deal with this, and how do you make sense of all of this, right? So enterprise systems are set to spend close to 77 billion in the next few years to deal with the problem of making enterprise systems cognitive, right? And this is where NLP bots fits in right in the middle, uh, because we are the only platform today that supports uh, free-flowing conversations. Uh, can read unstructured data at human parity levels. We are the only ones who do that, and can deploy this capability either on premise or on cloud, thereby making it uh, possible to have much more control over the data that the enterprise runs automations with. Right. Uh, so a, a quick look at how the whole ecosystem builds, and if you look at it from the bottom up, uh, the bottom is where all your CRMs, ERPs and whatever enterprise systems across functions are configured, it integrates into the next two layers, which is our product layer. Uh, we have a very powerful interface on which you can create your conversation designs, workflow uh, management, as well as manage your APIs. So this is a unique thing for us, wherein you can actually uh, group APIs, uh, customize APIs, and even build your own APIs on the platform and to interface with your custom uh, data sets and drive automations that are only unique to your enterprise. And of course, moving ahead, we, we also have uh, a layer that deals with security. We are a GDPR compliant platform, and we work with all clouds uh, that are available today, all popular clouds. And yes, we are uh, omni-channel and uh, can cater to voice and uh, text at the same time. Uh, this is something I'm just going to skip through. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in comparison with the popular uh, platforms, we are the only ones who, who are uh, who, uh, support unstructured data processing in, in the real format, as in uh, there is no change in the format when you're uploading an unstructured data set. And you can club that with your structured data uh, sources and your tasks to drive uh, very unique workflows. We are also the only platform that provides multiple formats uh, like PDF, uh, uh, PPTs, Word, uh, X, and even your URLs uh, seamlessly. Um, and of course, uh, most importantly, we have the cap capability of taking uh, user feedback in real time and driving the machine learning algorithms uh, to, to help the system uh, you know, adapt in real time. Um, and, and the user feedback could be either through button clicks or could be through you know, uh, uh, text interactions, which we can process. Uh, the popular use cases deployed on the platform so far across all our clients, uh, employee facing, customer facing, ITSM automation, Marketing support uh, related uh, uh, implementations. Visitor assist is a rare one. Uh, hiring automation is something we're doing with a very large Fortune 500 company. And knowledge assist is like if you have a large knowledge database, you can actually build NLP solutions to uh, manage interactions uh, de depending on the database. Uh, uh, further to that, so our vision is that an enterprise should not have to look at multiple processes or systems to, uh, to build on. Uh, with the changing business scenario or the changing user need. And this is an example of an actual use case where we started with a basic bot that is catering to employees with just information and then scaled up to transactions and then uh, moved ahead to uh, uh, you know, driving uh, uh, advanced uh, transactions across SAP as well as success factors, as well as uh, you know, uh, uh, like things like invoice processing and the works. Uh, uh, quickly looking at our model, we do not have a metered model. We have a per annum cost per use case model, 
which starts at 25K, so it's very clear that the enterprises do not have to deal with any surprises in terms of cost. Uh, we have a lot of clients, uh, nine Fortune 500 companies, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and spread across manufacturing, pharma, media, banking, and the works. Uh, I'm just skipping through this, and we are now in the process of going onto a SaaS model, where anybody with even a basic uh, amount of capability, you know, does not have to have an advanced tech capability, can build uh, custom NLP solutions for the enterprise uh, on our SaaS platform. It's, it's uh, scheduled, the version one is launching in Jan. Uh, this is a core team. Uh, all of us uh, have experience in technology, marketing. I come from a user experience, design, and process automation background. Uh, and But more than us, it is our fantastic team back in India, which is about 48 people, uh, hardcore uh, data scientists, uh, engineers, and experienced designers who make it possible. Um, multiple awards that we've won, I'm just skipping through this too. And this is what we're looking at. We're raising about five million. Uh, as a pre-series round uh, to drive our expansion into markets like the US and Europe, and uh, obviously building the product team to support the SaaS model. That's part of it. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, Sanjeev. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome John Four, CEO and founder of TrustLayer. And uh, TrustLayer is disrupting uh, the insurance tech industry. Um, by helping businesses with automated insurance verification. Hi, everyone. When, uh, when two companies work together, they have to prove a lot of information between each other. They might have to prove their identity. I really am John. You the company is whatever they, they say they are. Uh, they might have to prove a certain type of credential, such as like if an electrician comes in, are they actually authorized to be an electrician and work in this building? It turns out when companies also work together, they have to prove that one or maybe both parties has insurance information, uh, certain insurance coverage. One second. And the process is exceedingly manual right now. See this trillion dollar industry that's based primarily on paper and PDF. So when the electrician comes in, <clears throat> there's a light that's out, and she wants to work on that in the building. She actually has to bring a paper document that says that she has the right insurance coverage. So you get this paper document. You have no idea if it's authentic. Did it actually come from the, uh, the broker? And with our very first customer we were working with, unfortunately for our customer, we learned that the, uh, one of their 40 vendors was just committing good old fashioned insurance fraud and just making up coverage. Also, you get this piece of paper, let's say it's authentic, but you don't know that the information is still authentic, is still current. Just because someone had insurance six months ago doesn't mean that they still have insurance. And lastly, it's paper. Imagine if you were doing accounting, but you use, let's say, uh, Quicken. And when you press synchronize, instead of all your banking information coming into some accounting tool, you have your information just get emailed to you. And Bank of America just sends you 15 PDFs. Very inefficient, so we decided to solve it. We built a platform that allows for requesters of information, the actual vendors, suppliers, tenants, borrowers, and brokers and carriers to communicate in real time. And what's exciting about this is we've built an application that allows for all of these parties, this trillion dollar industry, to keep their data siloed, but yet share it on a point to point basis. This problem would be very simple to solve if there was one centralized location, a clearinghouse of sorts, where everyone could share their insurance app. There was a, like a New York insurance exchange. But the insurance world has had over 100 years where they could have built that and they've decided not to for a litany of reasons. So with our application, there's an opportunity to keep this data and share it in real time. In a sense, TrustLayer is like Platt is for the financial world. TrustLayer is for the insurance world. And what's pretty exciting, I think, is that there are three large consortiums that are taking place right now where you have actually competitors within the insurance world working together. The largest in the US just invested $55 million into the framework based on Corda. Last month, we were in London. We won first place in the Corda um, InsureTech application, in the, like their uh, startup event. And we're working with the largest consortium in the US. We're also working closely with the largest consortium in Europe that's building this framework. So right now, there's a very unique opportunity to play a role in, uh, in, in uh, providing this real-time point-to-point communication and just removing a lot of paper from the insurance world. Uh, the challenge, though, is for the next 10 years, you're still going to have a plumber show up at a job site. And he's going to have a piece of paper 
and you have to be able to handle these legacy workflows. So with our application, we also handle the legacy workflows. From one perspective, this is way more complex than the fancy uh, distributed ledger uh, infrastructure because when the plumber provides that document, it's often, it's often, uh, it's, a paper, it's a paper document, it's often crinkled, comes out of someone's back pocket. And, and we use some fancy computer vision and some tools to extract data from it, run it against the requirements for that particular project. Uh, and so it's really important that we also are able to handle legacy workflows, which we do right now with our, with our current customers. Uh, let me go. The market size here is massive. It's, imagine you've got, uh, we've got uh, 61 million mortgages here in the US. Every single mortgage, if anyone's bought a house here, every single mortgage requires paper-based documents to prove you have homeowner's insurance every year. Uh, you've got 100 million auto loans. Every single auto loan in the US requires proof of automotive coverage. And lastly, you've got, in the, just in the uh, construction world, almost every single construction relationship requires proof of coverage that goes back and forth. So we're talking about tens of millions of documents and a tremendous amount of insurance fraud as well as workers' comp fraud. Again, you know, with our very first customer, with, out of their 40 vendors, we flagged that one of their vendors was uh, committing coverage uh, fraud. And again, unfortunately for our, our customer, that vendor also, about two weeks before we learned this, committed $50,000 in damages and then just ghosted them. Uh, as far as, uh, and again, the problem is not just based in the US. We've got a pretty solid team. I'm raising $2.5 million right now for our seed round. The application's up and running. We have customers. We've got partnerships with the largest consortiums in the, in the uh, insurance world. And there's a very unique opportunity right now to, uh, to uh, um, uh, very unique opportunity to own the proof of coverage space within the insurance world. And uh, again, my name's John Four. I'm here from Trustlayer, and uh, I really appreciate your support. Thank you, John. All right, that was the last of our pitches. That was all 10 of them. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to give our three judges um, a moment to go and, and deliberate and make a decision. Um, and in the meantime, don't worry, because we won't keep you bored. Um, I'm really excited to bring up uh, my chief innovation officer, Alec Wright, uh, and also Whitney Sales, who is the managing uh, director at Acelloprise Ventures. I asked ladies first. Two for one. Extra mics. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> there are worse problems to have in the world. Uh, well, thank you all so much. So excited to, to get to take uh, about 20 minutes here and have a conversation with Whitney. Uh, I think, you know, we, we work across a lot of different industries, um, a lot of different business models, and a lot of different verticals. And whenever we come back to the question of enterprise SaaS and innovation inside large enterprise, uh, we often find ourselves begging Whitney to come to the table uh, and kind of share what I think is one of the most unique and kind of broad perspectives on what's happening inside um, enterprise, what's happening inside software as a service, what's happened in the past, but also where it's going. So we're gonna just take a couple minutes and dive into this question of where SaaS has been, uh, where it's going, and as an early stage SaaS founder, what you should be thinking about and where you should be putting your time. So Whitney, thanks so awesome. much for being here. And may maybe I'll just give a second. would love you to explain a little bit about your background, what you do, and what a Celeprise does, and kind of the, the really exciting opportunities in front of the, the program right now. Yeah, awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is, this seems really loud. Is that just me? Um, my name is Whitney Sales. I'm a managing partner at Acceleprise Ventures. We're a B2B SaaS accelerator and seed fund. Uh, we have offices in San Francisco, New York, and Toronto. We've been around for about five years now. Uh, we're on our 13th cohort in San Francisco, uh, and then we're also on our first seed fund. Um, my background is in early stage SaaS. So uh, over the past about decade and a half, um, I worked in early stage companies, basically scaling up uh, models with CEOs, then ran a consultancy for about four and a half years before I met my partner and got into venture. Um, developed a methodology called the sales method. So um, really a, a model on how do you prototype your go-to-market strategy almost as its own, if it's its own product. Um, and then I've been teaching it throughout the ecosystem um, and in our program now. That's wonderful. And I think that the even creation of a Celeprise, you know, a program just 
100% dedicated and focused on enterprise SaaS speaks to this transformation that you all saw coming and yep. you know this this opportunity. What are some of the dynamics inside business? Yes, wave. Um, so, I mean, there, there's two core areas I see. There's the democratization of information technology, and then the other piece of it is just the widespread adoption across enterprise. So, if I don't know, it, you know, it looks like we have an audience that's above average, above 30, but um, if you're under 20 in the room, you probably didn't grow up with software as a service. You probably still had to use CD-ROM and, and on-prem software. And so, um, you know, Salesforce was a big move towards SaaS, but uh, then as generations have gone, um, more enterprise companies, there's the industry standard, but more enterprise companies have gotten more comfortable using SaaS technology. So in the US, 94% of company, it, uh, companies have software as a service as part of their business. So there's been widespread adoption across enterprise organizations where in the past it, it wasn't. Um, if you look at Europe, you're at around 68%. If, if you look start, start to look in Asia, you're closer to around 30%. So um, there, there's just the wide adoption across the market. And then the second piece of it is uh, the democratiz democratization of, of technology in general. So um, if we look at some of the platforms that have been built, like TensorFlow, for example, um, it's made really revolutionized um, how ML and AI has been built. Um, you can look at um, uh, Insta pages or Webflow and um, designing uh, new websites and advertising. Um, there's a lot of new technologies that are just making it easier and easier to build software companies um, than ever before. So we're just seeing a huge, huge surge in them. Well, it's it's a beautiful segue into by two next questions, um, and I think you answered the first one with at least partially with this question of the geographic and international uh, maybe difference in attitudes or adoption towards SaaS today. But I think it's a common refrain that um, SaaS is now saturated and there are so many different SaaS applications out there, but do you see unmet needs and do you see opportunities for that next generation of, of SaaS companies and, and where would you direct them to be looking? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm personally a huge fan of, of I, I, this is, most investors will poo poo me for this one, but I'm a huge fan of regulated industries because it's regulation shift that software that supports them has to shift. So GDPR is a huge opportunity, CCPA is a huge opportunity, uh, new regulations in California around 401ks, um, healthcare, um, all of these areas provide big gaps um, that are gonna be longer term gaps that are we're continuing to see spread throughout the ecosystem um, on a global, global basis, uh, GDPR, you know, started in Europe, now in Canada, moving into the US. So um, there needs to be tools that support the regulation that's coming that's coming down um, from government. It's getting widespread uh, adoption. Um, also around, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity around the gig economy. There's, there's going to be regulations that are flowing into that. Um, so one of the things we were talking about earlier was around benefits. Um, and health services, and um, how do you start supporting this economy that doesn't have long-term savings, um, that doesn't have the support of a, a, a company um, and retirement plan? So uh, those are some other areas that the government's going to start doing things to shift um, shift the economics of this group, um, and the regulations that are gonna come down are gonna create a huge opportunity for, for software um, that is going to be an interesting model of a hybrid B2B to C. And it's a the the B two B two C reference is kind of a great highlight of another trend that we at least is very aggressively talked about, um, and that's this this consumerization of software and I, I think kind of a transformation of what we mean by enterprise SaaS and and who the target of that is and what success looks like. And I'm curious when you when you look at all this conversation of you know consumerization. What, what are your thoughts on it, and what does it mean to founders? Like, how, how should founders be thinking about this new world of expectations around consumerized software, if, if there is one? Yeah, well, 100% there's one. Um, so, I, I mean, Eric Reis pushed a lot of this, um, you know, several years ago around focusing on your end user and how, and looking at how they use the technology and designing technology based on how the end user is using it. Um, and there's been a lot of shifts around the enterprise where you know, we, have, we use our personal phones, our personal computers for work. Um, and so we want our, our software to be personal and have that choice. And so um, there's, you know, every VC pushes you know, bottoms up model, um, is pushing flywheel models. Um, and self signups, things like that, um, and it's really shifting quite a bit on uh, the sales 
the, the sales dynamics within organizations. So um, if you look at bottoms up models, they, they don't involve salespeople. Maybe it's surfacing it to an executive um, to surface a larger decision that needs to happen. Um, but I think that's gonna be shifting quite a bit. And this is coming from a salesperson. My last name is literally sales. Um, so it's, uh, you're shifting a lot of the dynamics uh, around sales and what's gonna be happening in the roles and education you're gonna be doing. Um, and so as a founder, um, thinking about your organization um, and especially selling into the enterprise, you need to be thinking about the flow of how your end user is gonna be using the technology and how do you create value from day one of them signing in and using the product within even minutes if you can. Um, and creating that flow of how do you do a bottoms up model where you can get mass adoption like I think one we all know is um, LinkedIn Navigator um, you know, for, for sales. Um, you, know, you, you sign up for it, there's, there's value in it immediately. But um, you know, it, those are some things to, to think about that I know everyone's probably aware of in the audience. And, and I think you know, the, the first layer that people like to talk about on consumerization is, is definitely design and, and how you know, how a, a user engages in an intuitive way. Uh, but then I think that the second layer, which you're really calling out to, is what this means for business models. And, and you know, I think if we, you know, if we think about the move from licensed on-prem to SaaS, and then very quickly it was, well, now the next SaaS is freemium SaaS. And, and as you look at the freemium model, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Is, it? is it something that every SaaS company that isn't selling 500K ACVs or million dollar ACVs should be looking for? Or is it something that is, you know, it's really the right company, the right go to market strategy? You know, how, how should companies be thinking about freemium? Yeah, um, so in this, this consumerization of, of SaaS, one of the things to look at is um, how many users within an organization are you going to have? Right, so are you going to have a very specialized group of users uh, that's going to have spe uh, very detailed and specific information that's going to provide a high level of value based off of how you visualize or analyze the data, or or make recommendations, or is it something that everyone's going to be using, and so uh, it, or ideally is getting a widespread adoption, and so when you look at how you design your model of business, it's probably on the spectrum somewhere in there. It's not gonna, it, you might have some that are way over here and you might have some that are like way over here. Um, but usually it's gonna be somewhere on the spectrum and how you design your model is really gonna be dependent on the level of usage you're looking for within an organization. So when it comes to freemium, for example, there's a great report by Tom Tongues that he put out at Saster this year, uh, Tom Tongues from Red Point Ventures, that looks at best practices around freemium um, for best adoption. Um, they, there's still a lot of questions in the market around how to design the best POC, but uh, proof of concept, sorry. Um, but uh, when you look at freemium itself, um, you have to look at whether a freemium model makes sense for your business based off of the number of users you're gonna have within the organization, or is it a proof of concept that you need to show that you can do what you say you can do for a very specified group? And so that's really what you're looking at in those two, two models and a blend of that. So not one size fits all, the ever Never. evolving hybrid that, you know, learning as you, as you slowly get adoption. Uh, and maybe we'll shift topics a little bit from trends to you know the founder perspective and what you've been seeing of really successful SaaS companies today and you know one one question i always like to ask is when you look at some of the really successful you know companies that have gone from early stage SaaS into kind of growth what are some of those common dynamics that you just always see or not always or at least consistently see of some of the best enterprise SaaS companies that you look at uh, there's a couple. Um, one, you have one person that's laser focused on growth and one person that's laser focused on building an ideal product. It's really hard to have to have one person doing both. That's not to say you can't, but usually they're gonna bring someone in to, to focus on the other area. Um, but you need to have one person focused on both. Um, the There needs to be a really great communication strategy and way of surfacing opportunities. So um, there was a there was a joke in Heroku in the early days that James Lindenbaum used to go to Adam, who's the CTO, and go, "You get two. So James would come with all these ideas of the things they wanted to build, and Adam would look at him and he'd go, "You get two. Which ones do you want?" And then the next sprint, they would design those two elements of the product. And they had a great feedback loop that was oriented specifically around what the customer wanted and was oriented all around growth at the same time. So it was a laser focus on growth, but also in building the best product um, for that uh, and building it right. 
the second thing is um, on the entrepreneur side, because that's what our program specifically focuses on. So there's the innovator side, which is the builder side, and there's the entrepreneur side, which is the, the go-to-market side of a business. Um, that's the way I look at it and frame it. Um, and if you look at the entrepreneur side of the business, one of the things is they really focus on a core user segment and getting going. Um, so it's not a distributed group that they're looking to go after. It's not a spray and pray model. They're not taking any customer uh, that comes through the door. They're focusing on a core segment of the market that's most likely to adopt their product now with eyes on the next group they're going to be going after. So each group they're going after, they're learning the great communication strategy. They're learning the right sales strategy. Uh, they're learning the integrations they need to have with eyes on the next group that's similar with an overlapping market so they can go after their next segment. And then, uh, I mean, it's exceptional advice. I think the, the one corollary of what do you see consistently working well is what do you see as a really common missed opportunity? That when you look at these early stage companies and you say, you know, something that they're not doing that a lot of them should be doing would create a lot of value. You know, are, are there any common threads there? So, um, I mean, focus is, is a big one for me um, that I like to see, and it's focusing on the right things. So what are the right things? It's the things that are going to grow your business. It's not necessarily being out networking unless you're in a place where you need to be networking, um, and you're going to be meeting people that you need to meet. Um, so it's, it's, it's making sure you're putting yourself in the right thing at the right time. Um, it's focusing on, okay, I need to meet certain number of customers. Like, laser focus, go to an event. Don't leave an event until you meet those certain number of customers that you need to meet. Um, there was a woman who was the, I want to say she was the VP of marketing um, for SurveyMonkey in the early days. And when she started building out her network, she was like one of the youngest VPs of marketing at SurveyMonkey. When she started building out her network, she would go to an event, she would keep 10 business cards in her hand, start in the back of the room and work her way forward and wouldn't leave until she'd given out all 10 of her business cards to force herself to interact and meet people. And she made, built her entire network that way. Um, and she's incredible. Um, but it's, it's a laser focus on what are you trying to accomplish at a given period of time and giving yourself goals and not giving your, letting yourself give excuses for not hitting them. Um, so on the side of the mistakes we see, uh, they'll, the things sometimes that we'll see is a founder won't focus on demand gen. They'll drop demand gen because there's you know, a piece of content they, they want get to get out. And there's, there's a balancing act for sure, but... If you don't have the funnel flowing through, you're not going to get the feedback loop you need. You're not going to drive. Um, you're not going to drive the revenue you need, which is going to make it harder for you to scale faster. And so, you really, as if you're on the entrepreneurial side of the business, you really need to keep that going at all points of time and focus on on keeping that funnel going, regardless of what you're doing and what you have to juggle. So, so focus, and then also managing everything else that Yay. you need to manage so I that mean, you it's, achieve it's your focus. Founder life, yeah. founder life, exactly. I understand. No, no one said it was easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, fair enough. I'd, I'd love to give, we have two, three minutes, maybe five minutes left. Happy to answer any questions um, or take any questions from the audience um, if there's anything pressing. If not, I have plenty more questions. There's also going. lots of wine. Yeah, this, uh, we, we are standing in between them and the wine. So, um, Please feel free. Yeah, um, I mean, we've the the level of creativity the founders come to the table with, and the level of knowledge they come to the table with about their industry. It's one of the things we look for pretty uh, pretty stringently. But uh, when we sit down and kind of go through the model, one of the things we really look at is how do your customers learn in general? And because they have such a depth of knowledge about their customer, it's really easy for them to pull out the tactics and strategies that their customers will, will learn from. And then it's, OK, now let's figure out how do we communicate with them there um, and surface the opportunity from a lead gen perspective. So uh, that's probably the thing I've been most impressed with is like the level of scrappiness they'll come to the table. Um, and ideas, and if when you get them brainstorming, like, no idea is bad, let's figure this out, where do your customers live, learn, um, and then starts to surface those areas. Uh, and then finding out about new tech, like, I recommend a tool called Duck Soup to every single person I talk to, because every single founder who starts using it, like, comes in and raves about it. Um, Duck Soup. It's a LinkedIn 
ad tool that allows you to target specific types of profiles within particular industries and send them a customized note. And it's $10 a month. Um, so that's one that I know everyone loves, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, any other questions before we, uh, I think we may have a mic yep. for you. Over here, this, this gentleman. It's okay. We're re we're recording. Give me one second. You look familiar, by the way. Uh, I was really interested in the comment you made about um, the. I think he's at the VP at Heroku, who said you get two things. Yeah. Uh, so just to get a bit gran it's CTO actually. CTO. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, so just to get a bit granular, was there any sort of reasoning around why two and not one or three? And then how long were the sprints? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know the specifics off the top of my head, but it was basically, uh, if you know James, James is an idea guy. Like he's awesome, James okay. Lindemann. Like he's, he's like, he is an idea master. Um, and so he would come with, they'd sit down, come with the ideas that he, the, the founder, so James was the CEO, would get a bunch of feedback from his customer base, would come to the CTO and they'd sit down with Orion and, um, and Adam and they'd sit and talk about what ideas they were, what they were actually going to build in the next sprint, and he, James was you get two. It's one of the quotes actually Adam has on his own personal website, um, and it's it's pretty funny uh, because of it was in order to build it correctly um, and build it well and stay focused instead of trying to build four things all at once. It was sure. let's stay focused on two things, make sure we're doing it really well, and it's more okay. around the concept of the strategy of focus versus only two things, if that makes sense. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, I think with that, we'll actually call an end to this conversation. I can't thank Whitney enough and really appreciate you spending time with us today. And in a moment, we'll be announcing the winners from the pitch competition. But real briefly, would love to give a round of applause to Whitney. All right, thank you so much, Alec and Whitney. Um, I'd love to just give another round of applause to all of the startups that participated tonight. Um, our sponsor, Brex, in the background, who, who helped make it all possible. Um, and now I would like to call up uh, my CEO, Nikhil Sinha, to help announce the winner, and all three of our judges, um, who deserve another big round of applause uh, for being here tonight and listening to all startups. <laughs> I'll hand it over to you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming to our monthly uh, pitch night. Um, I'm Nicholson. I'm the CEO of GSV Labs. And I'm really, really glad I wasn't a judge tonight. Because um, we had 10 terrific pitches. Um, I wish I'd been a fly on the wall to listen to the dialogue and the discussion amongst the judges. It couldn't have been easy. But I'm very pleased to announce that we do have a winner tonight, and that winner is Envision Mobile. Congratulations. I think we want. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah, we're going to take pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again for coming to the pitch night. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, January 14th or 15th will be our next uh, pitch night. As you can see, we have terrific startups here coming uh, every month. <laughs> Uh, presenting their uh, ideas or their business plans uh, or the state of the pro progress of their companies, raising money. Uh, it's also a great networking opportunity. Do spend some time um, meeting and talking to the founders and the CEOs. They're going to be back there. They're going to be standing next to their demos. Join us for a drink and some food as well after that. Uh, once again, uh, a great th uh, thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to the startups and thank you to our sponsors, Brex. Have a great evening. Thank you.